Have you ever wondered if everything we experience is just a projection? Instead, it could be a hologram where all the information is encoded on a distant two-dimensional surface. This idea came from the world of string theory and quantum gravity. Hooft first proposed it and Leonard Susskind gave it a precise string theoretic interpretation. According to Susskind, our three-dimensional world is just an image of reality coded on a two-dimensional surface. One of the key inspirations for the holographic principle is black hole thermodynamics. Typically, you'd think the maximum amount of information or entropy in a region of space scales with its volume, but in the case of black holes, it scales with the surface area or the radius squared. This is known as the Bekenstein bound. Think about a black hole. All the objects falling into it might have their information encoded on the surface fluctuations of the event horizon the boundary of the black hole. This idea helps resolve the black hole information paradox within string theory. There are classical solutions to Einstein's equations like Wheeler's bags of gold, which suggest values of entropy larger than those allowed by the area law. These solutions conflict with the holographic interpretation and pose challenges for a quantum theory of gravity that includes the holographic principle. One of the most famous examples of holography is the ADS CFT correspondence. This theoretical framework suggests that a gravity theory in a higher dimensional space can be described by a quantum field theory without gravity in one less dimension. So why should students care about this? The physical universe is widely seen to be composed of matter and energy. However, in a 2003 article published in Scientific American magazine, Jacob Bekenstein speculatively summarized a trend started by John Archibald Wheeler. This trend suggests that scientists may regard the physical world as made of information, with energy and matter as incidentals. Bekenstein asks, could we, as William Blake memorably penned, see a world in a grain of sand? Or is that idea no more than poetic license? He was referring to the holographic principle. In his topical overview, A Tale of Two Entropies, Baconstein describes potentially profound implications of Wheeler's trend. He notes a previously unexpected connection between the world of information theory and classical physics. This connection was first described shortly after the seminal 1948 papers of American applied mathematician Claude Shannon introduced today's most widely used measure of information content, now known as Shannon entropy. As an objective measure of the quantity of information, Shannon entropy has been enormously useful. The design of all modern communications and data storage devices, from cellular phones to modems to hard disk drives and DVDs, rely on Shannon entropy. In thermodynamics, entropy is popularly described as a measure of the disorder in a physical system of matter and energy. In 1877, Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann described it more precisely in terms of the number of distinct microscopic states that the particles composing a macroscopic chunk of matter could be in while still looking like the same macroscopic chunk. For example, for the air in a room, its thermodynamic entropy would equal the logarithm of the count of all the ways that the individual gas molecules could be distributed in the room and all the ways they could be moving. Shannon's efforts to quantify the information contained in a telegraph message led him unexpectedly to a formula with the same form as Boltzmann's. In an article in the August 2003 issue of Scientific American titled Information in the Holographic Universe, Bekenstein summarizes that thermodynamic entropy and Shannon entropy are conceptually equivalent. The number of arrangements counted by Boltzmann entropy reflects the amount of Shannon information one would need to implement any particular arrangement of matter and energy. The only salient difference between the thermodynamic entropy of physics and Shannon's entropy of information is in the units of measure. The former is expressed in units of energy divided by temperature, the latter in essentially dimensionless bits of information. The holographic principle states that the entropy of ordinary mass, not just black holes, is also proportional to surface area and not volume. Volume itself is illusory, and the universe is really a hologram which is isomorphic to the information inscribed on the surface of its boundary. An object with relatively high entropy is microscopically random, like a hot gas. A known configuration of classical fields has zero entropy. There is nothing random about electric and magnetic fields or gravitational waves. 
Since black holes are exact solutions of Einstein's equations, they were thought not to have any entropy either, but Jacob Bekenstein noted that this leads to a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. If one throws a hot gas with entropy into a black hole, once it crosses the event horizon, the entropy would disappear. The random properties of the gas would no longer be seen once the black hole had absorbed the gas and settled down. One way of salvaging the second law is if black holes are in fact random objects with an entropy that increases by an amount greater than the entropy of the consumed gas. Given a fixed volume, a black hole whose event horizon encompasses that volume should be the object with the highest amount of entropy. Otherwise, suppose we have something with a larger entropy, then by throwing more mass into that something, we obtain a black hole with less entropy, violating the second law. In a sphere of radius r, the entropy in a relativistic gas increases as the energy increases. The only known limit is gravitational. When there is too much energy, the gas collapses into a black hole. Bekenstein used this to put an upper bound on the entropy in a region of space, and the bound was proportional to the area of the region. He concluded that the black hole entropy is directly proportional to the area of the event horizon. Gravitational time dilation causes time, from the perspective of a remote observer, to stop at the event horizon. Due to the natural limit on maximum speed of motion, this prevents falling objects from crossing the event horizon, no matter how close they get to it. Since any change in quantum state requires time to flow, all objects and their quantum information state stay imprinted on the event horizon. Bekenstein concluded that from the perspective of any remote observer, the black hole entropy is directly proportional to the area of the event horizon. Stephen Hawking had shown earlier that the total horizon area of a collection of black holes always increases with time. The horizon is a boundary defined by light-like geodesics. It is those light rays that are just barely unable to escape. If neighboring geodesics start moving toward each other, they eventually collide, at which point their extension is inside the black hole, so the geodesics are always moving apart, and the number of geodesics which generate the boundary, the area of the horizon, always increases. Hawking's result was called the second law of black hole thermodynamics, by analogy with the law of entropy increase. Hawking's calculation suggested that the radiation which black holes emit is not related in any way to the matter that they absorb. The outgoing light rays start exactly at the edge of the black hole and spend a long time near the horizon while the infalling matter only reaches the horizon much later. The infalling and outgoing mass energy interact only when they cross. It is implausible that the outgoing state would be completely determined by some tiny residual scattering. Hawking interpreted this to mean that when black holes absorb some photons in a pure state described by a wave function, they re-emit new photons in a thermal mixed state described by a density matrix. This would mean that quantum mechanics would have to be modified because in quantum mechanics, states which are superpositions with probability amplitudes never become states which are probabilistic mixtures of different possibilities. Troubled by this paradox, Gerard Tehooft analyzed the emission of Hawking radiation in more detail. He noted that when Hawking radiation escapes, there is a way in which incoming particles can modify the outgoing particles. Their gravitational field would deform the horizon of the black hole, and the deformed horizon could produce different outgoing particles than the undeformed horizon. When a particle falls into a black hole, it is boosted relative to an outside observer and its gravitational field assumes a universal form. Tehooft showed that this field makes a logarithmic tentpole-shaped bump on the horizon of a black hole, and like a shadow, the bump is an alternative description of the particle's location and mass. For a four-dimensional spherical uncharged black hole, the deformation of the horizon is similar to the type of deformation which describes the emission and absorption of particles on a string theory world sheet. Since the deformations on the surface are the only imprint of the incoming particle, and since these deformations would have to completely determine the outgoing particles, Tehooft believed that the correct description of the black hole would be by some form of string theory. This idea was made more precise by Leonard Susskind, who had also been developing holography largely independently. Susskind argued that the oscillation of the horizon of a black hole is a complete description of both the infalling and outgoing matter, because the world sheet theory of string theory was just such a holographic description. 
While short strings have zero entropy, he could identify long, highly excited string states with ordinary black holes. This was a deep advance because it revealed that strings have a classical interpretation in terms of black holes. This work showed that the black hole information paradox is resolved when quantum gravity is described in an unusual string theoretic way, assuming the string theoretical description is complete, unambiguous and non-redundant. The space-time in quantum gravity would emerge as an effective description of the theory of oscillations of a lower dimensional black hole horizon and suggest that any black hole with appropriate properties, not just strings, would serve as a basis for a description of string theory. In 1995, Suskind, along with collaborators Tom Banks, Willie Fischler and Stephen Schenker, presented a formulation of the new M-theory using a holographic description in terms of charged point black holes, the de zero brains of type Tourier string theory. The matrix theory they proposed was first suggested as a description of two brains in 11-dimensional supergravity by Bernard de Witt, Jens Hopper and Hermann Nicolai. The later authors reinterpreted the same matrix models as a description of the dynamics of point black holes, in particular limits. Holography allowed them to conclude that the dynamics of these black holes give a complete non-perturbative formulation of M-theory. In 1997, Juan Maldacena gave the first holographic descriptions of a higher dimensional object, the 3 plus 1 dimensional type IDIB membrane, which resolved a long-standing problem of finding a string description which describes a gauge theory. These developments simultaneously explained how string theory is related to some forms of supersymmetric quantum field theories.